All right, we have uh, an excellent panel today. And that while they make their way on stage, I'm going to make a few points. Uh, first of all, today we have 20 minutes to cover uh, about uh, 20 days of material. So you have to uh, put on your seatbelts for that. It's going to be fast. Uh, you, and, and usually when, when people want to ignore me, they just uh, look at their mobile phone. Uh, but today they can actually uh, actively ignore me and just talk in the back of the room. So feel free to do that as well. Uh, let me introduce our panel. So to my immediate right is Valerie Vavilov, founder of Bitfury Group. And to his right, we have Nick Williamson, CEO and founder of Credits. And then Jan Scoyles. Uh, she is head of marketing for Coincilium. So our topic today is fairly broad. We're, we're going to be talking about uh, Bitcoin. Uh, we're going to be talking about blockchains uh, or distributed ledgers and, and possibly Bitcoin as the, the origin of blockchains. And the goal is to educate and inform you. So I'm going to give maximum talking time uh, to the panelists and avoid any kind of uh, fighting or, or bickering on uh, public versus private blockchains because th that, that's quite a large topic on its own already. And I'm sure that that'll come out and be emphasized in, in some of the answers. Now, 2015 was called the year of the blockchain or year of uh, blockchain hype. And I think that now when we get into more into 2016, we're going to start seeing many implementations of blockchain slash distributed ledgers, and some of them will operate in silos. Um, and there'll be many silos, but how will they interoperate with each other? And how will we have global interoperability? Um, how will, w what role will uh, liquidity and digital tokens play in this? So this is what we want to cover today. All right, so for the first question, I want to put it out, what are the specific use cases that we can see now coming from this technology, uh, either in, in banking or financial services? Uh, we, we talked about in the other auditorium, they talked generally about the technology, but let's talk about specific use cases uh, and, and really related uh, to something that we're seeing now as a close implementation. Who wants to take that? I can start. Uh, I think one of the uh, specific uh, use cases is the um, data integrity protection for banks. Because, um, of course, we can compare different kind of banks, uh, US, Europe, emerging markets. But financial system, for example, in Europe and US are working fine. In emerging, I think the um, First implementation and the biggest impact of blockchain will be not in US and UK, but will start in the emerging market. But of course, for US and UK, what is important and where blockchain technology can help is in historical data protection. And it will allow also to uh, provide the real-time audit, real-time data audit, what will help, I think, regulators and will... Uh, will do the financial system much easier for people. Well, why do you think it will start in the emerging markets? Because, for example, if we're talking uh, UK, uh, telling UK and Europe, and we're talking about uh, payments. Payments are just fine. Everyone has credit card, everyone has access to internet bank account. Um, you can pay in restaurants, you, I can transfer you money, you can transfer me money. It's, it's, it's taking... Uh, uh, small time, but in emerging markets, uh, people still don't have access to uh, financial system, to good financial system. So, are, are you seeing specific countries that you can mention where there's been uh, uh, an increase in, in Bitcoin adoption? Yeah, I think, for example, if we're talking uh, um, taking Kenya, for example, or African countries, um, they s didn't use the landlines of, of internet; they just switched to mobile internet. Mm -hmm. I think the, the, the same will be uh, with blockchain. They will immediately switch uh, to blockchain financial services. And not, not only financial services, because blockchain uh, it's, it's, um, 
can be implemented not only in payments, because blockchain is the, I think, the greatest invention um, starting uh, from uh, like the last 20 years since internet invention. Because when internet was invented, we internet allowed us to digitize our voice, uh, some data, information, and so on and so forth. But uh, all the assets still paper. Your car is a paper, house is a paper, uh, shares in the company is a paper. So, and this technology will allow not only to uh, disrupt, uh, for example, banking industry and financial industry, but I think also it will allow you to disrupt how you interact with assets. Because this technology allowing you to literally digitize anything of value, digi digitize any assets, put it on blockchain, and allow you to transact with your mobile phone. Well, and on the payment side, I think we're also seeing it in Venezuela and Argentina uh, for that use case. Uh, but Nick, is there, uh, is there something that, that you can add in terms of use cases for the technology? Similarly to um, uh, Valerie, we, we don't see that Western um, sort of countries taking up payments on the blockchain is going to be the first real emerging, emerging and uh, compelling use case, but we do see a lot of things happening right now um, in the back and mid office, especially when it comes to reconciling data between different systems. Um, you look at some of the sort of criticisms of banks adopting blockchain and um, or other financial institutions adopting blockchain, and the rhetoric is, well, if you're behind the corporate firewall, if you trust your employees and, you tr and everybody inside the bank trusts each other, well then why would you need a blockchain to talk to one another? And the answer is the same reason we have corporate governments, this, uh, governance. This reason is the same that we have an independent board of directors and that we make our financial directors take two weeks off a year. Um, and that's that we need to inject that accountability and that trust into these systems that are so fundamental and so integral to the way that we conduct our financial system and, and uh, sort of our civilization as it is. Uh, um, so you look at how you can use the blockchain really as sort of a data structure for um, having that transparent and auditable set of services, both internally and externally. And you see some real low-hanging fruit where we're already doing some projects using the blockchain as an auditing layer for data comes in one end and it's owned by certain IP holders. It goes out the other end and you need to make sure that there's controls on who's able to access and see that data and then you need an audit trail on top of that. And it's a little bit more dry than we're going to destroy all the banks and the governments and, and uh, sort of rise on the happy utopia. But it's also something that um, we're seeing very real value happen very quickly. And then building on top of that, um, once you get three or four of these systems set up, if you build them in such a way that they're interoperable with each other, where you can start passporting data, identity, and value across these different networks, you start removing a lot of the friction that comes with uh, interbank transfers, that comes with transfers across borders, basically anything where we've, we've sort of had to have a pledge of uh, central clearing parties and, and a hub and smoke model, instead of allowing uh, participants in a given uh, marketplace or a trust network to then interact more directly. Um, I think uh, it's also worth thinking about when we talk about use cases, is we need to think about in use cases. And I think when we're talking about how it's going to change the banking system, it's going to change payments, we have to consider that anything that's going to make an impact within the banking system and the financial world will take longer because we have regulatory uh, objectives that we have to meet. Uh, you know, this is a huge infrastructure that we're trying to. Uh, improve as well as change. And so I think when we're talking about use cases, we also need to think about the use cases that are working for the consumer right now. So not just the ones that you know the banks are working with, but also the ones we're interacting with. So for example, the role of nano payments, you know, how we're using those. So we could be, for, take for example, a company called Satoshi Pay. So they are allowing you to pay for content online that you're reading. Now, this is a common issue. You know, people don't like ads when they're reading content online or they don't like subscription firewalls that they're having to deal with. And so we're using blockchain and they're using cryptocurrencies to try and overcome this issue and allow consumers 
to read these articles and allow journalists to be paid adequately for them. That is a use case that's happening right now with blockchain. And I think, you know, 2015 was the year of blockchain hype. 2016 is the year where we have to see some kind of implementation going on. And stuff that's happening in banking systems, the financial systems, needs to happen. It is happening, but it's not going to happen all that quickly. And so we need to be looking at, when we talk about use cases, is, okay, well, how is this on the ground? And where is it on the ground? And that's where the likes of, you know, BitPacer and... You know, we're seeing remittance networks being set up, such as MEXBT. So I think we have to not just think about financial services in terms of the clearing and settlement and liquidity improvements. We also need to be thinking about, well, what other things do we use payment systems for day to day and how and, how and where are we interacting with them? Following up on that a little bit, um, our, our view on the consumer side of things is that it's probably still a few years out. And that on anything that's consumer facing, uh, we well, think that it's going to be much better supported if you do sort of clean up the spaghetti mess that's actually operating the underlying clear and settlement rules. Um, and with a lot of technology cycles, you see that uh, during and immediately after the initial hype, you see a lot of business value being created behind the scenes, and that there's a lot of work being done in the ensuing years to then polish up the hardware, polish up the software, and the interfaces and the UI, so that three, four, five years down the line, you actually do have a compelling platform and a compelling set of consumer-facing uh, services and products that are that people just pick up and adopt really quickly. If you look at, say, the PDA versus BlackBerry on the iPhone, it's when the iPhone came about that technology that we've had for years and that we have been polishing for business-driven tasks, that becomes something very compelling for uh, the consumer-facing market, just like with web services back in the late 90s into the early 2000s and other things like Facebook, and with personal computers and, and the like before that. Well, so, so Nick, you, I know you focus on identity as one of the layers, but what are applications that you can name that you're seeing demand for now that, that go beyond identity? Yeah, so whether you look at the things that simply are just a facet of identity, like KYC and reconciling, for example, there's not a single bank that only has one KYC system. They have five, six, seven that all have different uses, and that um, if you sign up for a second service with a bank, you often have to go through the entire onboarding process again. Uh, but we're actually working with some of them uh, to, to look at how might you reconcile between those systems in a more meaningful way. But then looking beyond just identity, um, when you look at any use case that happens in a regulated context, you need an identity layer of some sort. So um, whether you're looking at uh, systems that involve trade finance, whether you look at the actual post-trade settlement process, um, or things like uh, some of the, the government services, like property registries, um, each of those um, use cases needs an underlying identity layer where you can onboard an existing trust network into these software networks. And so if you start looking at, and one of the reasons that we are so focused on identity is if you start looking at the requirements uh, that an underlying platform needs to enable and, and needs to allow people to start working with, there's actually quite a lot of similarities in that identity layer specifically that cut across all these different use cases. So we are looking at some very specific initial applications and services with an eye to, okay, what's the fundamental commonality between all of them and how can we incorporate that back into the technology that we're uh, bringing into these banks and then also bringing it to things like our PaaS platform into the hands of people everywhere. Okay, so I wanted to ask all of you, all three of you, how do, we, how do you see us solving the problem of interoperability? If we follow some of the, the, the logic and the writings from, uh, uh, from blockchain distributed ledger companies, it, you, know, you can even have this concept of let a thousand blockchains bloom. Uh, so there's more than just one public blockchain or two public blockchains. We have things that are our, like our three maybe operating within a silo. How do we, how do we uh, solve the, the issue of interoperability if we have multiple blockchains? And where do, where do you see that going? Um, you can compare it with, um, with the internet. When the internet was uh, created, um, financial institutions and banks uh, didn't start to use the internet straight away. They created their own intranet inside. And, and it's okay because they 
care about the security, about uh, sustainability, and so on and so forth. So what is happening now in blockchain space, um, private blockchains are created. For example, one, one bank can have uh, its own private blockchain. Three banks together can have its own private blockchain. But by the end of the day, you will need to connect each of these private blockchain. It's just like you know, having an internal email, but communicating bank-to-bank -bank communication is still with FedEx. So that's why it's important to uh, take into account also public blockchain. Because uh, after one year, after two years, so I don't know how much time it will need, uh, but uh, private blockchain will be anchored on public blockchain and will be using public blockchain to communicate to each other. Okay. Uh, Jan or Nick, do you want to uh, contribute to that? I'm not the world's expert on private and public blockchains, but I think my instinct is, uh, similar to what Valerie was saying, is I think that we just, do we have to solve this issue or do we, see, do we allow it to kind of work itself out and see how banks and sort of consortium of blockchains end up developing and will they just end up sitting on top of public blockchains anyway? I think, um, I don't understand why when we have such an early stage technology, we all look at it and we go, well, that could happen and therefore we have to solve it. I think there we have some amazing minds looking at this and how it develops. Earlier on I was talking to Nick about currencies and I think that the way that currencies actually evolve best is when they're competing with one another and you're not forcing people to use just one currency and I believe that about blockchains as well. You know, I think if you allow people to explore and see what works for them, ultimately, you know, this will not solve itself but we will come to a solution that is working that will involve both public, private, and I suspect consortium blockchains as well. Yeah, so um, we actually view the uh, analogy of the internets and internets a little bit differently. Um, as we do build permission blockchain networks that can interact with each other, that can interoperate between each other, um, we view that a lot like um, our, our, our view of how the internet to internet um, evolution happened was um, basically the internet is uh, joining up a bunch of uh, smaller networks, and that's still how the internet works today. It's not one uh, big tube in the sky that everybody plugs into and everybody plugs into the same sort of uh, backbone cable, but it's a bunch of smaller networks that are joined up in ways that they can communicate with one another, and that if you're on the other side of the world and you need to pull data from a database or a web server that you're not directly connected to, well, we don't say, let's put every single piece of information in one server and call that the public internet. Instead, we say, well, the public internet is joining up a bunch of different servers that people can um, build and deploy on their own without having to get permission from anybody else to do so. And we communicate through known standards um, using HTTP and TCP IP. Uh, and that's what allows anybody in the world to spin up a new uh, web server in a matter of minutes and then have literally the entire world be able to uh, utilize it from there on out. Uh, and we see a similar thing with blockchains where anybody should be able to spin up a new blockchain network within a few seconds and then that blockchain should be able to talk to the other blockchains in a way that, again, allows for that identity, the value, and the information to passport across those different independent networks. Okay. Uh, Thank you, Nick. Okay, we have time for one quick question from the audience. Does anyone have uh, something to uh, address to this panel? No one? Okay, well then, uh, please thank, uh, let me thank uh, Valerie.